Well, good afternoon. Thank you all for coming for the uh, latest meeting of the Legislative Branch Capacity Working Group. Uh, pay no mind to the blue screen. Um, we've contacted the House to see if we could get this technology situation fixed up. Um, but since it's 10 after 12, we know you are all busy and we have a lot to talk about today. We decided to just plunge forth. So my name is Kevin Kosar of the R Street Institute. Uh, those of you who are repeat customers to this event uh, know that the Legislative Branch Capacity Working Group was set up by R Street in partnership with New America. And what we do is look at Congress um, from a variety of angles to try to figure out how to improve its functioning uh, with the realities of the 21st century being what they are. So we look at things like legislative process, legislative organization, uh, resources, pretty much every aspect of how Congress um, conducts itself. Um, so there's an endless number of topics that we can get into. We've done, I think, at least 10 meetings over the last year so far, maybe 12. Um, and we're gonna have a lot more to do. We're gonna keep chugging forward. We're not meeting in August. We realize everybody's away in August and it's gonna be even hotter in August and no one wants to show up and do deep thinking in August. So we'll see you all again in September, and if you're not getting invites through ledgebranch.com already, please just stop by the site and click the newsletter link. It takes about five to 10 seconds most, and you'll be on our list and you'll know about these events. So today's topic is evidence-based policymaking, and we'll keep things as we usually do, which is relatively informal. I'm gonna turn it over to each of our guests who will uh, briefly introduce themselves and tell you about what they are doing on this topic and share some of their knowledge. And the hope is that we all come out of here a little more wise about this topic, but also connected um, to the speakers so that if you want to learn more about a particular aspect of this issue, you'll know who to turn to. So with that, I'll let you go first, speaker. No, no, we can start with, start with here now. Yeah, the here and now. Well, good morning, afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is uh, Lucas Hitt. I'm currently serving as the Deputy Executive Director of the Commission on Evidence-Based <coughs> Policymaking. Um, for, uh, for those who are, uh, are unaware of the commit, well, who's aware of the commission? <coughs> All right, great room. Um, so in that case, I don't need to tell you much about it. Um, we were uh, established by statute last year uh, in March, um, and. Uh, uh, got our 15 members appointed by mid uh, midsummer and uh, began work. Uh, the the highlight I guess I'll point to is that our report will be published on September 7th. Um, uh, at least as of an hour ago when I left the office, everything was still on schedule and on time. So hopefully uh, nothing has changed in the last last bit. Although this is one of those kind of projects where that may be uh, more likely than not. Um, we have 15 members. Uh, the, the membership of the commission, based in the statute, is, uh, is, is uh, members appointed by the president, the speaker, the majority leader, minority leader uh, of each chamber. Um, the makeup is kind of interesting. It's, uh, there's seven economists, um, which means there's at least 14 opinions. Uh, there's also three other social, science, social scientists, two lawyers, two financial uh, experts, and a computer scientist which has been a really interesting exercise in watching these 15 extremely intelligent people that have come from very different backgrounds and, and bring different experiences and insights uh, to see how they, uh, they, they bring together uh, around, uh, around this issue. Um, in that structure, though, what was interesting is that the law required that five of the 15 be appointed specifically because of their background in privacy. Um, and so another way of putting this is, is that there are uh, 10 or so who have a, a research background and have an interest in, in making data more available, and then there are five or so that have uh, a privacy background and have um, maybe uh, a, a bit of a different perspective on, on the same issue. Um, in terms of what we've been working on, uh, the commission has held, uh, I think we held eight public meetings and three additional uh, public hearings. Our hearings were held, uh, were field hearings held around the country where anyone who, was, uh, who, who would like to was, was given an opportunity to testify in front of the commission. Uh, the meetings were more structured uh, around specific topics and, and specific witnesses were brought in to, to address certain issues. Um, we also had a request for comment, which uh, received about uh, just shy of 500 comments, which, um, for, uh, for, which I think was a pretty strong number for this target. Um, for those who have been on the receiving end of requests for comments in the past, uh, I would also say that about 80% of them were rather substantive, which is, um, which is also rather remarkable. Um, 
So, uh, so we got a lot of input from, from, from those various those various avenues. We also actually, uh, maybe many of the staff, we all come from statistical agencies uh, when we're not detailed <coughs> so maybe we couldn't help ourselves, but we also uh, fielded our own survey of federal agencies uh, and, uh, and, and, and wanted to make sure we were getting a good sense from the, from the agency's perspective, what were some of the barriers and challenges that they were running up against in the process of, uh, of, of pursuing evaluation and evidence building. Um, so we've spent a lot of time hearing from people. Uh, we've then, then sort of moved out of the public eye and have been uh, for the last four months in sort of deliberation uh, phase. Uh, the commission continues to meet, uh, they meet in person every month, uh, and then frankly three to four hours a week via phone and, and, and other technologies that work at times and not at other times. Uh, and so there's been a, there's been a, a, a large effort to try to, 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 to review everything that people said to us. Um, and understand what the, the implications of that were, uh, and then sort of bring them together with the scope and with the um, with the in, with what the commission was charged to do. Which I should say, the statute was kind of specific in some ways and not specific in others. Um, we're, our charge is largely to uh, examine strategies for better using data, in particular data that the government has already collected, um, and also how to help the government carry out routine evaluation as, as part of, uh, uh, of, of sort of everyday program administration and rather than more of an ad hoc basis. Um, so we've got a fairly large focus on sort of the barriers to data access and the policies and statutes uh, that, that exist that may provide, uh, may prove problematic in that respect. Um, and then the statute also specifically asked us to examine whether or not there was a need for, as the statute refers to a data clearinghouse, uh, to facilitate access and, and, and other aspects of data. Uh, so those are, those are some of the big topics that are tackled. But the scope of this is really very broad, and that's been an interesting challenge for the commission is to sort of figure out what elements of, of, of that scope uh, they're going to focus on. Um, so I'll, I will say that the, the commission is going to focus on issues of, of access. It's going to focus on issues of capacity. It's going to focus on uh, issues of maybe potentially even some of the more mundane things that uh, of, of like how the government handles HR and acquisition issues and some of those things that, uh, that that actually at the end of the day you can have the best ideas but if you can't get the stuff and the people you need to do them uh, you can't actually implement them so uh, the commission views its scope around this, this charge is very broad um, and uh, will be I, I suspect addressing many of these issues um, and uh, with that I guess I'll pause and we can hear from others and look forward to any questions I can. <clears throat> Good afternoon, I'm Andrew Reamer. I'm a research professor at George Washington University at the Institute of Public Policy. Uh, and my, the focus of, of my work is uh, on the ability of uh, the federal government to promote the economic competitiveness of U.S. businesses and global markets. Uh, my background's in regional economic development. Um, and uh, a lot of the work I do is around the role of statistics and information in informing public policy. Uh, I found it's interesting and important to understand the history of, of uh, how the federal government in, in general and Congress in particular has sought to promote the collection and utilization of statistics and information, let's call it evidence, um, over time. So what I want to do today is, it, it, I, have a slide, I have a slideshow that has too many slides because the idea was to, for it to live on the web. And uh, uh, so I'm, I'm, I will run through the, uh, the highlights of what's, what you can't see. Um, as I think about it, there are five kinds of evidence I think that are, are useful for public policy making. One is descriptive, like describing the conditions, poverty rates, for instance, distribution of income, uh, trade balances. One's explanatory. Uh, what are the factors that lead to poverty? So social science research is evidence that can be used for public policy making. Another kind is anticipatory. So the, the, uh, the Senate came up with this, has a bill. It's considering on uh, reforming uh, the Affordable Care Act. And it goes to the Congressional Budget Office. And they say, they project forward, well, here are the, what we think are going to be the outcomes of this particular bill. Um, so they're doing kind of a what-if analysis. Evaluative, which is what Lucas just talked about, looking at program evaluation, so it's kind of backward looking. Okay, so we had this program, uh, uh, what happened, and what can we learn from it? And that's been uh, Speaker Ryan's particular interest for the past uh, few years. And the fifth kind is, is, is probably a better term, but for the moment I'm using formulaic, that the idea, Congress has 
authorized hundreds of financial assistance programs like Medicaid that are formula-based, that depend on evidence, that depend on data that determine the geographic distribution of federal funding. Um, so uh, the themes that I, I want to point to are <coughs> Since its founding, uh, founding of the nation, con members of Congress have, have, an, have had an interest in evidence-based policymaking from the get-go. Uh, from the get-go through the 1970s, Congress regularly expanded the federal government's capacity for evidence-based coll evidence collection and, and analysis. Um, and from the founding to the president, many members have had a distaste for or indifference to evidence. Uh, my perception is that members' attitudes about evidence depends on the, the perceived impact of that evidence on their perceived political interests. Right? People think they know what the political interests are, which is not always the case, as you know. And people think they know what the evidence might mean for that political interest, and that's not always the case as well. Uh, I'll get to the bottom line, which is that my observation looking at history, and I'll give some examples, is that Congress cares most about evidence when it has the incentive to use that evidence for, its, for members' political purposes. And the example I use is tariff setting. Up until 1934, Congress set tariffs. Congress jealously guarded its congressional authority to set tariffs. So Congress was doing industrial policy for 140 years, and it set the tariff for every single commodity. And it spent 140 years trying to figure out how to get the data it needed from the, federal, from the executive branch to set tariffs intelligently, whether, whether, that intel, whether that, the aim was public purpose or their own parochial interests as, as members of Congress and the parochial interests of their constituents. Once Congress gave up the power to set tariffs, it lost interest in statistics. And so a question is how to get Congress to care about evidence because it's the members' political interests. Um, I, I want to give a couple of examples. I just gave you five kinds of, uh, of, of evidence. Uh, and I'm going to give a couple of examples from historical pr purposes, a lot of which, when I discovered it, I was like, oh, wow. So how many people know what the American Community Survey is? Okay. The American Community Survey is the current iteration of something that started in 1790, of adding questions to the decennial census. You know, the decennial census was created by, by uh, Constitutional Convention to count noses in states to determine how many representatives each state got. And in 1790, James Madison had the bright idea, say, hey, we're doing a census, why don't we add some questions to it? And we now have the opportunity for obtaining the most useful information <coughs> for those who hereafter might be called to legislate for their country if this bill, the Census Act 1790, was so extended so as to embrace some other objects beside the bare enumeration of, inhabit of the inhabitants. It would enable Congress to adapt the public measures to the particular circumstances of the community. I have been trying to be, Madison's term was community. I've been trying to get the, the census bureau to rename it the Madison Community Survey. <laughs> um, so he goes on about how important this is, and it's and at in this conversation, Mr. Page from Virginia says he thought this particular method of describing people, this, describing the people, would occasion an alarm among them. They would suppose the government intended something beside gratifying an idle curiosity. All their measures are suspected of policy. Madison replied, the people would suppose the information was required for its true object, namely to know in what proportion to distribute the benefits resulting from an efficient government. So a couple points. One is that evidence-based policymaking was in the mind of Congress, and particularly the kind of father of the Constitution from the beginning, and there was pushback from the beginning. So then. Uh, we can look at the every 10 years that the Congress debated the census. And in 1850, there was a huge debate because members of representatives and, and senators from the South did not want the decennial census to be counting, collecting information on slavery because they were afraid it was going to be used to abolish slavery. So uh, there's this guy from the North, uh, Senator Clark from Rhode Island, saying the census embraces a great variety of statistical information, 
needful, useful, indispensable in my estimation to, co to correct legislation. And then he pushes back, he, he, he's, he's talking about the people against collecting this information. Our power to collect this information is denied. Its utility when gathered impugned, and its accuracy when collected in it, when, when collected question in advance. This is 1850. I could have read you this and without giving you a date, I would have said that has been happening today. Uh, and so this uh, member from South Carolina says, how old the person was, how much property he had, how many children his wife lost, were questions annoying to, annoying to a sensitive mind, even when put by a private person, and how much more so when demanded with a penalty by a censor of the government for publication. Having gone thus far, who knew where they would stop? 1850. So let's jump to the Republican National Committee's resolution of 2010. Um, whereas the Census Bureau has over the years progressively added more and more survey questions to the census, going far beyond the scope of just counting people. Whereas the ACS is, is an invasion of privacy that demands detailed personal information the government has no business knowing, seeking, or compiling, whereas specific questions about the respondent's personal finances are asked, including the value of their home, their yearly income from all sources, what they paid in personal property taxes, etc. Resolved and Republican National Committee recognizes the Census Bureau has gone, gone above and beyond constitutionally intended purpose for numerous people. It's, over, it's invading privacy, overreaching, and intimidating through the implementation of the American Community Survey. And the Republican National Committee supports the elimination of the American Community Survey. Um, in 2012, uh, the House uh, uh, voted to um, eliminate the American Community Survey. Oh, it's, it's somebody's backpack. <laughs> uh, and, the, and the Senate pushed back. So the, the point of this story is I just want to create a thread of evidence-based policy making data collection from 1790 to the present and the, the nature of the debate over it, which has been consistent over time. Um, Kevin, tell me how much time you want me to talk. Okay. Um, so, Congress, how many people have heard of the economic census? The okay, economic census is information collected from every U.S. business every five years. Its start was in 1810 when Congress asked the Treasury Department for information on manufacturing so Congress could set tariffs. And Treasury said, we don't have it. But why don't you amend the Census Act of 1810 and collect information from manufacturers? And Congress said, okay. So that's the start of the economic census that continues to this day. Um, a couple more examples, and then I will quit. It, right after the Civil War, so tariffs provided all of federal revenue up through the Civil War. It, I fi it finally occurred to me why the Internal Revenue Service is called the Internal Revenue Service, because Prior to the Civil War, there was no internal revenue. It was all tariffs. So to distinguish collecting taxes from internal uh, economic activity, Congress created an internal <laughs> revenue uh, stream. So in, in 1866, they created a office of a special revenue commissioner to advise Congress. So it's almost like a, a BEA and a Council of Economic Advisors combined in this one guy who was 36 years old. Um, and a political journalist, because there were no trained economists. Uh, and so he, he writes these incredible reports. I'm blown away by this. He's doing estimates of GDP in 1868. And he says, uh, Congress tariffs are too high. And uh, it's too high. You are serving parochial interests. And so uh, Congress, members of Congress, the Republican majority, write pro-tariff pushes back, says, you don't know what you're talking about, and we're going to get rid of your office. So, just an example, we, we've had conversations of late, publicly, about evidence, like with the Congressional Budget Office coming forward with, uh, and pushback saying, this is much crap. 
is again to say that there's been this dynamic going back. Congress creates an entity to advise it. Members in the majority don't like what they hear. They impugn and diminish and sometimes get rid of the, uh, the, the, the evidence makers um, in that regard. Okay. Uh, Evaluative evidence, I think two nice examples of the present is, are the, the Commission on Evidence-Based Policymaking. And also, right around the same time, Congress approved the Census Bureau Budget Initiative to create an administrative data clearinghouse in the Census Bureau for the purposes of program evaluation. So Congress approved two things to promote evaluative evidence within three months of each other, going side by side, that's great. Um, in the realm of, of, of uh, see, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip to the end. Okay. Um, I was going to talk about formulaic, but I'll, I'll come back to that. That's useful in the, um, in the Q&A. I want to end with this. I, I mentioned that it's my perception that from the 1790s to the 1970s, Congress more or less was into funding executive branch and then later actually congressional branch capacity to gather, analyze, and produce evidence for Congress's own policy making purposes. Um, uh, you know, as, as you know, in the, seven, in the 1990s, Congress got rid of the Office of Technology Assessment. I talked about the, the importance of data to Congress because it, particularly economic data, so it could set tariffs. <coughs> And in, in the 1980s, there were a set of hearings in Congress looking at the inadequacies of the economic statistical system because it was so tilted toward manufacturing, which had been the economic base of the country for well over a century, but you know, certainly by the, the 50s, 60s, <coughs> 70s, more and more uh, data were going into certain, uh, uh, economic activity were going into services. And so the hearings were held in the 80s. The result was that President Bush, in 1990, proposed to Congress that uh, the Census Bureau be given money to collect information on services industries in the economic census and every year. And the co total cost of this grand thing was $4 million a year. Um, the idea was to improve GDP statistics. Congress turned that down. Congress turned down that request from the Census Bureau 13 times, from 1991 to 2008. The Census Bureau, there was inflation, so by 2009, <coughs> it was eight million bucks. So Congress, being asked for money, $4 million, which, you know, I, uh, I think it pays for about three weeks of Bryce Harper's salary, worked for the Washington Nationals, Congress turned it down 13 times, 12 times, 13th time it gave it. The result was when Lucas's agency, the Bureau of Economic Analysis, came out with its advanced <coughs> statistics at the beginning of the Great Recession, their initial, they blew it. And they said they blew it because they didn't have good information on finance, insurance, and real estate. And the result was that the, 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 when Obama came into office, the GDP data far underestimated the size of the Great Recession, and the Fed was working in the dark. The, from in, the, in, the, in the fourth quarter of 2008, the GDP estimates went from minus 3.5% to minus 9%. Mm -hmm. Minus 9%. And the reason was that Congress didn't give census the data, the money it needed to collect the data for BEA to use to better estimate GDP. <clears throat> Think about the consequences of that, that unreliable GDP data, that, over, that overestimation of the, of the depth of the, um, or the underestimation of the depth of the Great Recession. 13 times. So the question in my mind is, what will it take for Congress to care enough about evidence to fund four million bucks in data collection so that the American people can retain a few trillion dollars of assets? 
You know, we'll leave it at that. Yeah. yeah. Sure, hold on. We just voted the next speaker, please. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> So, uh, so my name is Tim Shaw. Um, I am a senior policy analyst at the Bipartisan Policy Center. Um, I'm working with um, Sandy Davis, who's a senior advisor here on, a, on an evidence-based policy project more widely. Um, on a, we're going to be, uh, we've heard a little bit about the commission, about some of the history here. Um, we're a little bit on the more prospective side. So um, for a little bit of background on our project, um, I came out of the Government Accountability Office. I worked there for a number of years, as well as for a little while in the IG community, um, the Inspector General community. Um, and Sandy spent uh, a number of years at the Congressional Budget Office and the Congressional Research Service. So we are very much on the legislative support side of, of the kind of how, how Congress actually uses the evidence that those agencies produce. Um, and Sandy was brought on uh, around the time that the commission was originally formed to take a look at. So the commission is looking at um, uh, the, the collection of data for the use in evaluative purposes for federal and government programs um, and instituting process for routine evaluation. And a lot of that happens on the executive side of things. What we were brought in to take a look at is, how, so, so there are a number of agencies and professors, academic institutions that are building some, some evidence uh, around what is the most efficient use of public dollars for the public outcomes that we're interested in. To what extent is Congress using that information now? Um, how can it support the development of that information? And where in the process could that be better? So, uh, be done better. So we've, uh, we put out a report in April, kind of outline as we see them, the key issues um, that, that face Congress in this kind of new world of a lot of big, of big data and a treasure trove of program evaluations that are starting to come out about federal programs, and how can Congress best take that information, put it into its processes, and use it for, for policy making. Um, we focus a lot on what uh, Professor Reamer describes as evaluative evidence. So when, when we get evaluations of federal programs, do they work? Um, and and in, so, so real briefly, who here is familiar with the term RCT? Randomized control trial? All right, so we have a pretty uh, knowledgeable audience here. But basically, when, when we have these conversations a lot, um, we, we, at, we get asked the question of what constitutes rigorous evidence. And, and we take at, the, at BPC a, a kind of broader definition, is that you take evidence that is based on studies that are well designed, that have good data that underlie them, and use them in the process to make, you know, evidence-based and evidence-informed policy decisions. But in the field, as a lot of you all know, um, more specifically, the, the evaluations that we, we talk about are, can we prove that this program has a causal relationship on the outcomes we're looking at? So if you take the example of a worker training program, um, for a long time, uh, people would count the number of people um, that came out of that program. Were they trained? You test at the end, did they get the skills, and, and call that program a success. But we're interested in more is do those folks get a job afterwards, and do they get better jobs and a more number of jobs than they would have without that program? Um, and again, the question is to what extent can that, that information be used um, at the congressional level? Um, we have, in, in the more recent history, as we've looked at kind of a survey of how this has gone, Recently, there has been um, a lot more interest and growing support for use of evidence, particularly in the evaluative capacity, um, in, in both the executive branch and with Congress. Um, in particular, we've seen a lot of experimentation as, at the state level. In building our recommendations and kind of doing our deep dive, we've talked to a lot of folks who are, who, who are trying to do this in a number of different places, partic particularly in the states. In, um, the administration, but also taking, talking to congressional staffers and to what extent they get the information that we, they need. Um, and states being kind of a more cash-strapped scenario and a lot of times having a more um, party alignment in their legislatures and with uh, their executive branches have, have gone a little bit further in some of these areas than we have seen at the federal level. Um, there are policy labs in a number of states um, that, that have good examples of when, when there is support for these initiatives, both on the legislative and executive side, 
uh, they can work together and commission reports that come up um, and actually influence budgetary decisions. Um, on the federal branch side, uh, it, it, there, uh, a number of years ago, the Government Performance and Results Act was instituted. And this came out of a lot of big changes in social policy and this interest that executive agencies kind of report and come up with the outcomes and, outcomes and specific goals that they were working towards so they could be judged on whether or not they were successful. Um, that was originally instituted a number of years ago and then updated more recently, um, giving it the affectionate uh, uh, acronym GIPRAMA, as we called it, at uh, GAO, which no one liked it when we used, and the joke is falling sadly short now. <laughs> um, but uh, more recently, uh, the Bush and Obama administrations have also signaled internal support for this. So again, on the executive side, um, after GIPRA was passed, that there has been a lot of interest, particularly in programs that I would consider having less political sensitivities around them, in figuring out whether or not the methods we are using are actually successful at getting the outcomes that we want. And when, when the question isn't often, when the question isn't about whether or not we're going to take funding away or whether we're going to redirect it to use towards more effective kind of programs and um, and policies, there seems to be more consensus around there. So uh, under the Bush administration, there was a push towards um, putting money, money um, in home visiting programs that have, were evidence-based um, and actually proved to have the outcomes uh, that were successful. Um, there was also the Institute of the PART program, which is a program assessment and rating tool, which was an attempt to have agencies define what success looked like in each of the agencies and then rate them against that. Are you, are you getting the job done that you said you were going to get done? Um, under the Obama administration, some of these uh, initiatives were continued and new kind of uh, programs popped up. So many of you might in the room might be familiar with tiered evidence uh, programs. And the idea here is that they are funded at different <coughs> levels depending on the amount of evidence that's there to support them. So if it's, it sounds like it's got a good program design, um, but there, it, it hasn't been implemented and there's a lot of testing that needs to be done, that program will get a small amount of seed money around, along with a little extra information for, a little extra money specifically to do an evaluation of it and see whether it works. Do the program, uh, do the evaluation, come back to us and see whether or not you can build the evidence in support of that. And then tearing up. The more you see success, the more money in, in an organization um, can get. There's also been uh, movement in the what's called the pay for success area. And that's basically align the, the idea of aligning federal funding or any funding in the social policy space in particular, but in other areas as well. Um, the money with programs that demonstrate success, again, along these causal mechanisms. Can you, can you prove that the activities that you're doing in this program actually come to the outcomes um, that you want? Um, this issue, pay for success, is uh, an area of policy that's been developing fairly recently, and even the experts internally are having debates about what that means. But for a long time, um, the two have been conflated with uh, social impact bonds, which is another funding mechanism <clears throat> where you pay a private sector operator to implement a social program, and if that is successful, you then pay them um, with, with a return. So there's a lot of interesting things going on in the space, and we're trying to look at, again, how can Congress support these initiatives more broadly, um, and which of these are the best? Do we know that social impact bonds are a good funding mechanism? You know, they've been around for just a relatively small amount of time, and we, we want to take a look at those things. Um, we'd, also, we'd also like to emphasize that this isn't just on the executive branch. There have been some uh, movements on the congressional side. We consider the establishment of the Commission on Evidence-Based Policymaking a great step forward. Um, the Every Student Succeeds Act in the last Congress had um, an evidence-based framework for funding specific programs that again showed that they work. There were bills that came out of uh, the House that had similar, um, similar language about supporting evidence for foster care programs and social impact partnerships between the governments and private actors. And so we, we see that this, this is a, can be a bipartisan issue. If you're looking at, again, if you're looking at programs where you, everyone agrees that this sort of work should happen, moving towards um, 
to getting the evidence to institute those improvements um, can be done across the aisle. And for all of the bills I've mentioned, they did have bipartisan co-sponsors, which obviously is really important to our, to, uh, to our organization. So there are a number of barriers as we kind of took a look at how that, that body of information that's developed in, in the academic areas and in the executive branch at, at what might be the barriers or what, what could help those things get to Congress and into the congressional policy making space. Um, and we came up with kind of six key issues that we'll be focusing on, though they can be framed in a number of ways. The, the first is the transparency and the credibility of, of data. Um, can Congress see the source, can policymakers see the source of the data, and can they trust it? <coughs> There's a long history, as we've heard a little bit about, of when, when, when people who created data about or evaluations about a particular program come to the Hill, um, either from the, the executive branch or another, another group, um, can the policymakers trust that, that that data is independent, that it was well designed, and that it, it doesn't have its own agenda that might be contrary to theirs. Um, and there has also been movement in the past when those questions come about to create capacity for trusted sources that Congress can, can, um, can again, can trust the information coming out. So the Congressional <coughs> Budget Office um, and the Government Accountability Office, gotta give a plug for my old employer, are good examples of this, I think. Is that you can, when you have, when you have a place that policymakers trust the data, um, in the vast, vast majority of the time, they will uh, trust the source, even if they, they don't, if, and even if they don't like the outcomes, if you can create a, a trusted source. There's also the question of access to data. A lot of, and, and this is a lot of what the commission is looking at, so we won't be doing too much in this area, but whether or not people who can do the studies have access to the government data they need, and what are the privacy constraints? Because we really do need to protect people's private information. Um, I was a, a federal employee when both the, the China hack, and there were two that happened, my data was out there. And then before that, uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield and both Target were hacked at the same time. And so my data is everywhere. <laughs> and we're, we're interested in making sure that that doesn't happen as we try to expand the access to data for researchers to get this critical information. Um, whether or not, uh, the next issue is whether or not Congress has the capacity um, and when we say that, we mean staff, time, and expertise to really take all this information in and, and judge whether or not it's appropriate. Um, the, as this group has talked about, I'm sure, I think there are a lot of questions about whether or not there is sufficient, um, there is sufficient capacity and, and resources there to do that interpretation and specifically tailor it to a congressional setting. Uh, the next issue we talk about is timing, and, and, and this is really about do the studies that we have in support or against these programs line up with when Congress needs to make a decision, right? Uh, at GAO is somewhat famous for taking a long time to do these things, and that's because it takes a long time to do them right. But that doesn't mean that when the study is published, it is then useful in the congressional calendar. If you publish a study on a big, and a, on a big social policy area, and the authorization bill passed six months before, and it's not gonna expire for another five years, well, you know, you might have missed the boat. <coughs> so to what extent can we, can we get um, uh, Congress to know what data is available, um, and what studies might be underway, and, and align those two things? Um, so that so that Congress has the opportunity to act on that data and the evidence if it wants to. Again, usability in the legislative process is a big question I've touched, touched on a little bit. And then expanding it to other policy areas and existing programs. A lot of the, this movement about evidence-based policy has been around evaluative data and around social programs in particular. Um, and there is uh, a desire uh, on, on our end, I think on others, to to take these principles that we're seeing in these spaces and see to what extent we can expand them um, to other policy areas. Um, so we have published our, our report. We're gonna be publishing another one around the same time as the commission will, um, where we're hoping to have recommendations in these areas. And we're hoping in, in two broad areas. One is building institutional capacity. Uh, and this is, it sounds easy to say, you should have staff. 
that can understand these issues <coughs> and give you advice. But it, but where exactly that fits in into the process, and where you know there there is kind of an appetite to increase that capacity, is a question. And we're working closely with our um, congressional stakeholders on how uh, on how best and what what recommendations would be most helpful and, and where it could fit. So there are a number of fellowships uh, that have uh, people bring people up who have expertise in particular areas. Um, a lot of those go to particular parties as opposed to being a kind of holistic resource to Congress and, and different committees. So the question is there about what, what could be done there. There is a lot of expertise in, this, in the legislative agencies already. Again, GAO, CBO, CRS, Library of Congress, all those groups. How can they be coordinated to be a little more focused on these issues in particular? Um, uh, and, and could they... Is there a recommendation there to expand their role? Um, and then other kind of ad hoc options. When you, when you have something that's coming up right now, can, can congressional staff really get the information that makes sense and that applies to that particular situation in the time they need it? Um, and lastly, before I, I, I'll stop, uh, we're to, uh, Sandy is a, a little more uh, versed in this area, but where in the legislative process itself can we create tools and incentives for policy make for congressional members to use um, and support evidence. So a number of bills have come out with statutory frameworks defining what good evidence means for use and evaluations. That sort of thing in a number of different policy areas could be helpful. Can we support them in crafting that language? Um, improving congressional oversight, uh, is something he likes to talk about a lot. Where can we insert evidence into the oversight process to make sure that Congress is holding agencies accountable to their goals and outcomes? Um, embedding evidence and legislation. To what extent can we have funding tools that support the development of evidence um, at executive agencies? And, and then lastly, where in the legislative process can we insert the use of evidence um, to better, again, incentivize the support of evidence-based programs? Uh, my, uh, this is, we're, we're kicking around a lot of these things. But um, a lot of the folks at BPC are old budget hands. And so if they think a lot about the 10-year budget window and scoring and budget points of order and a lot of those things, and that uh, gets sensitive and like about where in that process uh, evidence could be used or like additional studies could be used. Do, can, do we'll create robots or will it, will it actually kind of grease the skids to support these programs? But those are the sorts of things we're thinking through. Um, to, to conclude, I'll say, that again, at BPC, we think this is and should be a bipartisan issue, but in developing these recommendations and supporting these things in Congress, it runs into a lot of the same issues that have run through the field of program evaluation and evidence-based policy making um, as, we, as we see it here. So um, I helped teach a program evaluation class for Carnegie Mellon. One of the things we teach the students is that there's always this tension between when I evaluate this program, uh, am I using it to improve the program or am I using it to cut the program? And, that can, and some folks are interested in either. And ideally, you'd want to do both, right? There are some programs that need improvements and that we would love to improve to see the outcomes do better. But there also might be programs that their, their, their um, structure just doesn't work. It doesn't get to, um, to the need that we are trying to address with public dollars. And, and we ought to be using data to decide whether or not those programs should exist and whether that should be diverted to other programs um, or that funding be used more effectively. But as we make these recommendations and as we continue having these conversations, um, it's important that it, it not those things one one not outweigh the other, or else you know this this type of conversation can get subsumed by kind of partisanship on one side or the other, um, as we've alluded to has happened over time. And so we're very focused on on maintaining this kind of dual <coughs> usefulness of, of evidence of evidence in the policy making process, and hopefully that can continue in the conversations going forward. Right. Thank you. Well. Uh, before opening up to the floor, in the uh, interest of kind of further connecting folks to one another, I just want to uh, point out two, two folks in the room, there may be more, but there are two folks I know of in the room who have substantial expertise in uh, evidence-based policy making, program assessment, that sort of stuff. 
Um, for you who are in Congress, uh, the first person I'd point you to is in the third row back there, Clinton Brass, uh, who's been at CRS for more than a decade and has a compendious, remarkable knowledge and library about all things relating to program assessment and all that sort of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and he, he, can be, he can be endlessly useful to you in, in thinking through the complexity of how to do this because not all measurement tools are good tools. Some can give you bad results and some can mislead you in a variety of ways and create a false confidence which can make situations even worse. So that's one person. The other person I want to mention is a, a new connection of mine. In the back, Jeremy Ayers of an organization called Results for America. And you just want to give a quick description of what uh, what your group is up to? Uh, sure, sure. Our whole mission is evidence-based policymaking in the social sector. Um, I think one of the connections Kevin is making is we just published a document called Nine Ways to Make Federal Legislation Evidence-Based. So it's sort of a clear and simple document for our predominantly aimed at congressional staff. Um, with some simple language that you can insert into any voting legislation in order to make it evidence-based. We probably oversimplified it, but it's ready to be made and ready to be used uh, as soon as we like it. And it includes a lot of the examples of the folks on the panel I'm talking about, so I'm happy to share that or talk to the folks after. Yeah, and that particular document we're going to be pushing out uh, you know, a little teaser piece on it on lifebranch.com uh, tomorrow morning. So that should end up in your, your mailbox and so you can click through and check that out. Um, it seems to me that we've hit on some interesting themes here, which are, um, you know, evidence. I don't think too many people would say we should make more decisions with less evidence. Uh, there's a truism about we should use evidence. But then there's the basic problem of how are you going to use it, and what are the interests in actually uh, to make people pick it up and put it to use. Um, and I guess, uh, in, in part, uh, based on my own Hill experience, but uh, inspired a bit by uh, Brookings, Philip Wallach, um, I would say that when it comes to evidence-based policy making, um, we want more of it, but we should also be um, realistic about how far we can get with it, because Congress is not just a calculating machine. And I don't think we would ever want it to be just a calculating machine, only making decisions based upon kind of data crunching. Um, it's a complex animal. Uh, it's human beings getting together and forming coalitions and trying to figure out how to get along with each other, creating these strange, be strange bedfellow arrangements. Um, and society and demography and the interests are endlessly shifting around, uh, and so Congress has to respond to that. Um, so I just put, put that out there as a as a thought, but let's be clear, more evidence is good, more evidence should be used in conversation, and I wish there was more fact-checking done of some of the evidence that gets thrown into conversation.